On August 9, 1980, high school sweethearts Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, both 19, disappeared after attending a wedding reception at Concord House, Concord, Wisconsin. Within the next few days, searchers found some clues about the couple's whereabouts scattered across town in Concord. A pair of pants, Tim's car with his wallet inside, some ropes, and a pair of women's underwear. These clues led to a grisly discovery. Two months later, the bodies of Tim and Kelly were found savagely violated and left to rot in a field. Almost three decades later, advancements in DNA technology, coupled with an unlikely witness, and an investigator's relentless search for truth led to the identification of the perpetrator. A man so unassuming, even his neighbors had no idea he harbored such dark secrets. But who was this man? And why did it take so long to find him? Today's story takes us back to Concord, Wisconsin, a small town in Jefferson County, Wisconsin. With a population just over 2,000, the quiet town has many parks and nature spots, making it an excellent place for people who love the outdoors. So activities like hiking, biking, fishing, and camping are common among the locals. Concord has a violent crime rate about 7%, about a third of the U.S. average of 22.7%. In the 1980s, when the main events in today's story occur. Concord was the sort of place where people never locked their doors and neighbors looked out for each other. So, it was just the sort of place where 19-year-old high school sweethearts, Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, believed they could get married, settle on a farm, raise their children, and grow old together. In 1980, Tim Hack and Kelly Drew were 19-year-old high school sweethearts engaged to be married. Although Tim lived with his family in Hebron, a small town in Jefferson County, and Kelly lived with her family in Fort Atkinson, also in Jefferson County, the couple first met when attending Fort Atkinson High School. Kelly was a beautiful, kind young woman with a passion for cosmetology. Tim was a strong and hardworking farm boy. They were both loved by their friends and family for their kind-hearted natures, but as a couple, Tim and Kelly were seen as people for other youngsters to aspire to be like. After high school, Tim started his career as a farmer, and his best friend was a tractor nicknamed The Lonesome Loser. Meanwhile, Kelly went to beauty school and had just graduated in 1980, hoping to become a hairstylist and beautician. On August 9, 1980, Tim and Kelly attended a wedding reception at Concord House, Wisconsin. The couple had plans to meet some friends and go to a carnival after the reception, but they never showed up. The last time anyone saw them alive was around 11 p.m. on August 9, 1980, when they left the reception. By the morning of the following day, August 10, 1980, when they still hadn't been seen or heard from, Tim's father, David Hack, filed missing person reports for both of them. That same day, David found Tim's brown Oldsmobile in the Concord House's parking lot. Locked inside the car was Tim's wallet containing $67, his jacket, and his checkbook. They were boyfriend and girlfriend. There was some talk, I remember. Uh, did they lope? Did they take a bus someplace? On August 15th, searchers found Kelly's pants and underwear by the roadside, about three miles from Concord House, with male bodily fluids on them. They also found some ropes by the roadside that had been knotted by someone who appeared to have military experience. Over the course of 10 days, multiple pieces of clothing belonging to Kelly are found along the roadway within a six mile radius of the Concord House, as well as about a dozen pieces of rope with various knots tied in it. We have very good evidence now. The discovery of these articles of clothing shifted the case drastically. Suddenly, it was no longer a matter of finding a couple who might have just decided to take off and have a romantic getaway. It was now a matter of trying to find them alive because they were likely in danger. About two months later, some squirrel hunters from Milwaukee were out in the Izonia, Wisconsin area, about seven miles from the Concord House. While walking through a wooded area along a railroad track parallel to Highway 16 east of Watertown, they found the badly decomposed remains of Kelly Drew. She was completely naked. About 100 yards away, they found a fully clothed male body that was identified as the body of Tim Hack. The case, now officially a homicide, was dubbed the Sweetheart Murders. The manner of death for both of them was homicide. I had the radio on and they announced over the radio that they had indeed found both bodies. And um, so, I'm going to tear up. 
So I remember walking in the kitchen and the detective is there with my parents telling them that they did indeed find Tim and Kelly. The cause of death was not immediately apparent because investigators found no murder weapon at the scene. However, upon examination, the medical examiner found stab wounds on Tim's body and ligature marks on Kelly, suggesting death by stabbing and strangulation There were ligature marks on Kelly's ankles and wrists that were consistent with having been bound. Kelly was most possibly strangled based on damage and insect activity around the throat area. The bodily fluids found on Kelly's clothes also suggested assault. The Sweetheart murders had all the elements of a sensational story, so it started making headlines across the country. Two teenage sweethearts appeared to have been murdered in a senseless act of violence, and police could not identify the killer or killers. Their investigation began while interviewing everyone who knew the couple to find out if anyone might have hated them enough to kill them. Police also interviewed everyone who attended the wedding reception, including the Concord House staff who worked there that night. One of the question workers was Edward Wayne Edwards, a handyman working at the Concord House. Edward, who lived in a campground adjacent to the Concord House near Interstate 94, claimed that he had not seen the couple and that he was not even at the Concord House around the time the couple went missing. He claimed that he was deer hunting in the nearby woods. However, police noticed that he had a broken nose. When they asked him about it, he claimed he had gotten it during his deer hunting trip. It seemed weird to the investigators because this was August and deer hunting season in Wisconsin was around November. After the police questioned him, Edward moved his wife and his five children away from Wisconsin in September 1980. Meanwhile, the most promising lead investigators had were eyewitness accounts of a dirty-looking van that had been parked next to Tim's car in the Concord House parking lot. Witnesses claimed that they noticed the van suddenly driving away suspiciously around the time Tim and Kelly were last seen. Edward had a van that fit that description, where he often kept a 357 revolver. But without a plate number or strong evidence connecting him to the crime scene, police could do very little to follow up on that lead. And like that, all other leads in the investigation dried up. The case file was shelved and the case went cold. In 2028, 20 years after the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, Richard Lewell from the Wisconsin Department of Justice, one of the investigators in charge of the original investigation, asked for the case to be reopened. For almost 30 years, Lewell had been unable to let go of the case. For almost 30 years, Lewell had been unable to let go of the case. And now that he was close to retirement, he wanted to do everything in his power to close the case. In an interview, he said, as I was reaching my retirement age, DNA was making drastic leaps and bounds. He felt more confident pursuing the case now because of technological and scientific advancements of the last couple of decades. His newfound confidence was reflected in how he approached the case with vigor. Luell had a hunch that the police had already interviewed the killer in the earlier stages of the investigation and that the person's name would be on file. He just had to find it. After two months of digging through the files, witness statements, and interview recordings, one name stood out to Luell. Edward Wayne Edwards. Not only did Edward have the opportunity and means to commit the crimes, but the fact that he moved his entire family out of Wisconsin shortly after police interviewed him raised red flags. Luell and a team of cold case investigators decide to follow up on his hunch that Edward was the potential killer. When they interviewed Edward's neighbors from when he lived in Concord, Wisconsin, they learned that Edward had been a very difficult person to live with. He was short-tempered and volatile, a restless man who often beat his wife and children on a whim. They said he was basically a monster. His son, John Edwards, who was now 37 years old in 2008, described him as a troubled man saying, I don't think he knew how to control his emotions. There was some type of rage there. In 2009, April Balasio, Edwards' daughter contacted authorities with disturbing information. She said she knew some things about the cold case murder of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew that she believed could help investigators close the case. However, this information that she had implicated one of the men closest to her life, her father, Edward Wayne Edwards, a former Marine with a long history of crime. April was a curious child growing up, and her father's unusual life was the most fascinating puzzle to her. Throughout her life, she had questions about how her father lived and why the family had to move around so often. One day, when she was now an adult, she came across the news article about the unsolved murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, and she remembered that they had moved from Concord, Wisconsin around that time. 
The puzzle was finally falling into place, and she just knew she had to contact authorities. Edward Wayne Edwards was born in Akron, Ohio in 1933. He lost his parents at a young age and had to live in an orphanage run by nuns. Edward's time at the orphanage was marked with physical and emotional abuse, ultimately shaping him into a restless and rebellious teenager. He had several run-ins with the police for petty crimes like shoplifting and breaking and entering, and by 17, he was serving time at a juvenile detention center. By 1951, when Edward was 18, he was released from juvenile detention on the condition that he joined the U.S. Marines. But after just a few months as a Marine, Edward disappeared and had to be dishonorably discharged. He wasn't ready to leave the life of crime behind, because Edward soon found himself in jail again for robbery. By 1955, when he was 22, he escaped from jail in Akron and traveled across different states robbing gas stations. Edward would spend the rest of his 20s and 30s as a fugitive, drifting around the country while doing odd jobs here and there, working as a ship docker, vacuum cleaner retailer, and handyman. From his autobiography, it is easy to tell that Edward enjoyed his notoriety during this period. According to him, he never tried to use an alias or disguise his identity while committing his crimes because he wanted to be famous. In 1960, at 27, Edward was once again in prison, this time for attempting to impersonate a federal officer. However, he escaped from the Portland, Oregon jail, where he was being held, prompting the FBI to place him on its 10 most wanted list in 1961. In 1962, Authorities caught up with Edward and imprisoned him in the United States Penitentiary, Leavenworth, but he was paroled in 1967 for good behavior. In his memoir, he attributed his growth to the influence of a benevolent guard at Leavenworth. After his parole, Edward got married and became a motivational speaker. In 1972, at age 39, Edward appeared on two television shows to tell the truth and what's my line. That same year, he released his autobiography, The Metamorphosis of a Criminal, the true life story of Ed Edwards. He was on numerous talk shows and game shows with this book about his life as a master criminal. In the late 60s, Edwards was on the FBI 10 most wanted list. He was a suspect in a double homicide in Portland, Oregon. They couldn't prove that he did it, but upon checking the criminal history of Edward Wayne Edwards, I see that he has been in prison. He has been convicted of numerous crimes to include robbery, uh, vehicle theft, fraud, arson. He's done a lot of, of things. He exhibited all of the classic signs of, uh, the stereotypical signs of a serial killer. He was a bad wetter. He had an affinity for starting fires. He was extremely controlling. It seemed like the stars were finally lining up for Edward. He had beaten the system. He was on his way to success. Unfortunately, Edward's good luck did not last long. In 1977, he committed his first murder. His victims were 21-year-old Billy Lavaco and his girlfriend, 18-year-old Judith Straub, residents of Sterling, Ohio. Billy and Judith went on a date on August 7, 1977, but never returned. Later that day, Judith's car was found in the parking lot of Silver Creek Metro Park, with her shoes and purse still inside. The following day, August 8th, Norton police, assisted by family members and a National Guard helicopter, launched a search for Billy and Judith. The search party found their bodies in the high weeds near the Metro Park. They had been shot point-blank with a 20 gauge shotgun. At the time, investigators could not connect Billy and Judith's case to Edward, so he got away with the murders. These murders also established a pattern that would continue with the murders of Tim and Kelly. Meanwhile, by 1982, when he was 49, Edward was back behind bars in Pennsylvania for arson but he was still proud of his criminal accomplishments because in 1993, he wrote a letter to the FBI requesting his criminal and history records for cities in 19 states. The records were supposedly for a new book he was writing about criminals he met while in prison, such as Tony Provenzano, Charles Manson, and Jimmy Hoffa. In 1996, Edward, 63 years old, committed his third murder. His victim was his foster son, 25-year-old Danny Boy Edwards, who lived with him in Burton, Ohio, for seven years. Before he met his grisly end, Danny Boy was a soldier in the U.S. Army. Edwards somehow convinced him to abscond from the Army and return home. When he got home, Edward tricked him into entering the nearby woods and then killed him with two gunshots to the face. Edward left Danny Boy's body in a shallow grave. A hunter eventually found it there and alerted the authorities, 
but like his first set of murders, Edward also got away with murdering Danny Boy for the next couple of years. People close to Edward like his son John and his daughter April described him as a troubled man. He was extremely abusive to his wife and children, resulting in his children moving away from home as soon as possible to escape his abuse. Investigators believed Edward fit the bill for the stereotypical serial killer. He had a long history of crime, he was physically violent with his family members, and the fact that he wrote a book about his crimes showed that he was a narcissist. Edward also had military experience, so he would have known how to tie the knots on the ropes investigators believed were used to strangle Kelly. In addition, Edward's history of arson fits perfectly with the image of someone extremely controlling. By the time he was in his mid-70s, he was overweight and had to move around in a wheelchair, depending on an oxygen tank to breathe. So, his neighbors in Louisville, Kentucky had no idea that behind his elderly facade lay an evil mind that had done so much damage. However, with new evidence in April's statements, investigators now had a more solid reason to believe Edward might have been involved in the murders. They had to visit him. When investigators got to his home in Louisville and initially began questioning him, Edward denied knowing anything about the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. He claimed he hadn't heard anything about them going missing, although he had been questioned about it in 1980. But while investigators doubled down and pressed him more, Edward confessed that he had drank some beers at the Concord House on that fateful night and that he may have seen the couple while he was drinking. He also said, contrary to his earlier statement, he had not been deer hunting that night. After the interview, investigators asked if they could take a swab of his saliva for DNA testing. Edward confidently said they could, believing the DNA test would not reveal anything he did not want investigators to know about. When the state crime lab tested Edward's DNA sample, it matched the DNA found on Kelly's pants. In 2009, Edwards had settled in a trailer park in Louisville, Kentucky. He was pleasant and friendly to his neighbors, and none of them suspected that he had such a dark history. That is until police picked him up and brought him to Wisconsin on July 31, 2009. He was charged with the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. While he was being interviewed, Edward was confronted with the results of the DNA test. Investigators asked him to explain how his bodily fluids came to be on Kelly's clothes. Edward started stuttering, cooking up a story about how he and Kelly had gotten intimate earlier that evening of August 9, 1980, but the act was consensual. He was shifting in his seat, moving his hands every which way. When he sensed the investigators were not buying his performance, he sighed and muttered something under his breath. After replaying the interview recording hundreds of times, I can remember exactly where I was when I when I heard that recording. He thought it was under his breath, or maybe it was subconsciously that he said it. Investigators were confident they had heard what Edward said. Damn it, I killed her. It was as good a confession as any. The gig was up for Edward, and he decided to plead guilty to the murder of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. In April 2010, Edward Wayne Edwards was convicted of the 1980 Sweetheart murders and given two life sentences to run concurrently. Although Edward had asked to be executed, Wisconsin had no death penalty. But according to retired homicide detective Phil Waters, Edward had been in and out of prison. He knows what life is like. He's not a guy that wants to be sitting in a prison ward somewhere and dying a slow death. So hoping to convince the state to give him the death penalty, Edward wrote a letter to the Ohio prosecutor's office, saying you're going to want to put a needle in my arm. In 2010, Edward confessed to the murders of 21-year-old Billy Lavaco and 18-year-old Judith Straub, but it turned out that when he committed the murders in 1977, the death penalty was unconstitutional, so he did not get his wish. Instead, he was given a life sentence for each murder, but he still had one trick up his sleeve. In 2011, during a jailhouse interview, Edward confessed to killing his foster son, 25-year-old Danny Boy Edwards, his motive was the $250,000 life insurance policy he was set to receive upon Danny Boy's death. This time, his plan worked. On March 8, 2011, Edward was sentenced to death for the murder of Danny Boy Edwards. Although he was only convicted of five murders, police speculate that he could have at least 9 to 15 more undiscovered victims. In the book titled Peyton Allen Files, the author, Phil Stanford, suggested that Edward might have been responsible for the murders of Beverly Allen and Larry Payton, which took place in Portland, Oregon in 1960. In March 2017, Detective Chad Garcia from the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office 
One of the investigators in charge of the Sweetheart murders suggested that Edward might have been responsible for 15 other murders, including the famous Zodiac killings. Retired homicide detective John Cameron also believed Edward was responsible for the Zodiac killings and other high-profile unsolved cases, but these claims have not been proven as of yet, so they are considered conspiracy theories. On April 7, 2011, Edward Edwards passed away at the Corrections Medical Center, Columbus, Ohio, at age 77. His death was of natural causes, a relatively merciful ending to a vicious crime spree that left five dead and dozens wracked with grief. Edward escaped execution by lethal injection, which had been set for August 31, 2011. Although Edward was eventually arrested, and he ultimately did not get away with the murders of Tim and Kelly, their family members have not exactly found relief in that. Kelly's mother, Norma Walker, said instead of getting closure, Edward's arrest ripped open old wounds. She said, You hoped this day would come, but now that it's here, it's really hard. Everything starts all over again. All the memories come back. He robbed me of my daughter, robbed me of my Christmases, birthdays, weddings, everything families do together. As for Tim's family, the fact that their son and his girlfriend's killer had been found was enough. Tim's father, David, said he was just glad it's over and was grateful for the DNA technology that confirmed Edward was the killer. April Balasio, Edward's daughter whose tip helped close the cold case, now spends her time trying to help the families of victims with unsolved cases find closure. Through her podcast, The Clearing, she investigates cold murder cases and tries to get authorities to reopen them. Tim Hack and Kelly Drew had a bright future ahead of them that was violently snatched away by their killer, Edward Edwards. Edward the serial killer had nothing personal against the couple, they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, which makes it all the more tragic. Although Edward ultimately got arrested and sentenced to death for his crimes, some believe he escaped justice by dying of natural causes just weeks before he was scheduled to be executed. What do you think about that? Did Edward get what he deserved? Did his victims get justice? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this channel for more.